Good afternoon. It's Sunday afternoon, April 20th, 19th, April 19th, Sunday afternoon, around 2.45 in the afternoon. And uh, this Sunday morning, many of you were able to go to Sunday school via Zoom class or something of that nature. But uh, some of the folks in the First Baptist Church of Sweetwater are not able to do Zoom meetings. And so I've determined I'm going to try to do a Sunday school lesson and provide that for them in digital form where they can listen at their leisure. By the way, I am John Adams, the Executive Pastor for Administration and Education at First Baptist Church of Sweetwater in Longwood, Florida. That's for the benefit of someone who might watch this later who's not a part of our congregation. Uh, the basic format I'm going to be following is to teach a lesson out of the uh, Explore the Bible curriculum from Lifeway Christian Resources. I'll be using the same basic uh, lesson plan and commentary that we send to all of our adult teachers who use this curriculum to help them in their preparation to teach on Sunday morning. It's actually the same lesson plan and same commentary that I followed this morning when I taught this lesson online to my class. So I hope this helps you. And uh, without further ado, before we get into the lesson, let's uh, commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is the great teacher and that I'm simply an instrument. And I pray that you'd help me not to get in the way of the ministry of your spirit as he opens Holy Scripture to our understanding. Thank you for loving us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So if you want to follow along in the Bible, you'll need the book of Romans open. And uh, we're going to be focusing on some verses out of the eighth chapter of Romans. So I'll let you find that in your scriptures. And then I'm going to make a few comments about the study that we've been doing thus far. Um, let me introduce this lesson in the same way that I introduced it earlier today. You are probably like me. There have been times when you need to buy something that you do not have the amount of cash that it requires to pay for that item. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's a house, a, a big ticket item that costs more money than you have. So you have to find someone who will trust you and loan you the money. And when you borrow that money, you sign a contract with the lender and agree to make payments on schedule. So if, um, if you do not keep the terms of the contract, there's a penalty that goes with that. A penalty will be assessed, whether it's a late fee because you pay late or foreclosure if you fail to pay at all. Um, when we study this lesson today out of the book of Romans chapter 8, we're talking about the security of a person who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And in reality, the debt that we have incurred to God because of our sin is the debt that was placed on the back of Jesus on the cross. And so whenever he took the weight of our sin on the cross, when we repented and trusted him as the payment for the debt of our sin, God declared that debt paid in full, never to be placed before us again. Jesus died on the cross as our sin offering, releasing us from the penalty of sin and death. Uh, Paul, in this passage, reminds us that we have no obligation to live according to the flesh, that is, the old person that we were before we came to Jesus Christ. And he's going to talk to us about how that because the Holy Spirit came to live in us, that we are no longer obligated, uh, we're no longer indebted to the man of sin that we were before we trusted Christ. So let's look into this uh, and into the context. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is one, really one of the great chapters in the Bible. It begins with the promise, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful promise. There is no condemnation. It ends with a promise that nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so you are looking at in chapter 8 some of the richest, uh, most 
wonderful promises of our relationship with God. And the portion that we're going to be looking at today really gets into the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. In the first part of chapter 8, uh, the role of the law and the role of the Holy Spirit are contrasted. And uh, it is said that the law, weakened by sinful flesh, could not fulfill God's righteous requirements. However, God sent his Son as our sin offering, so that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in those who walk according to the Spirit. Now, when Paul talks about us walking according to the Spirit, he's simply walking about, talking about our life after we came to Christ and after the Holy Spirit came to indwell us. Living, living according to the flesh means to set your things on this earth and the things of the flesh, and that always results in death. But living according to the Spirit sets one's mind on the things of the Spirit and results in life and peace. So the person who lives according to the flesh is in hostility to God and cannot please Him, while the person living according to the Spirit has the Spirit living within them. And only those who are children of God have the Spirit of God. And that Spirit produces life and righteousness in the believer. So it's a wonderful introduction in the first few verses. And then we come into the focus of the text for our study today, which is Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. Uh, listen to these verses as I read them to you. Verses 12 and 13 read as follows. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Listen to that again. We are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, earlier, Paul had contrasted a life lived in the flesh and a life lived in the spirit. He said in verse 6, Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Uh, because the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in the believer, that spirit will bring life to the believer. The Spirit of Christ living in believers means we are not obligated to the flesh. Uh, the Greek word that's translated obligated here can refer to someone who is in debt financially or to someone who is under moral obligation. And here Paul obviously is talking about the moral obligation, that latter sense of the word. Paul used the Greek word translated flesh some 26 times in the letter to the Romans. Thirteen of those are found in these first 13 verses of this chapter. So it's worthy of us to just stop and think a minute about what does it mean to live according to the flesh? And how can we know when we're living by the flesh or by the Spirit? And I'd refer you to over to about the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, also written by the Apostle Paul, where he talks about uh, the works of the flesh and the work of the Spirit, and specifically list the fruit of the Spirit. So it's it's fairly easy, if you're honest, if you're really open, open with yourself, to look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit and do a self-evaluation of your attitudes and your actions. And all of us, during the time of the coronavirus pandemic, have had to face some new and peculiar challenges in our lives. And some of them we've probably measured up and we've been faithful to our calling of God and we've walked in the Spirit and behaved like people of Christ. And other times we may have re reverted back to the old man, the person we were before Christ. We may have behaved in ways that upon reflection we really should not have done that, said that, acted in that particular way. But it is worthy to take time every day to ask yourself a simple question. Uh, how have I reflected the likeness of Christ today? How have I truly walked in the Spirit versus how have I simply operated in the strength of my own willpower, my own flesh? 
because what Paul is trying to help us to see is that we don't have to we don't have to make the same mistakes we did before we came to know Christ. We can lean into the Holy Spirit and trust his indwelling presence and find strength from him to be victorious to overcome. I've encountered a lot of people in uh, years of being in the ministry that have trouble with this um, concept of the Holy Spirit being within them. Uh, they'll ask me questions like, where is he? I, do, I don't feel him. I, I can't tell that he's in my life. And I have to say to them that the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is, uh, generally speaking, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is appropriated by faith the same way your salvation is. If you are a child of God, you are a child of God because you've placed your faith in the promise that God has made that whoever trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord will be saved. If you've repented of your sins and you've relied strictly on Jesus as your salvation, the scripture promises us that we are saved, that God makes us his child. In the same way, the scripture promises us that when that transaction takes place, when we come to Christ in faith, that the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And so he is at work in you. You may, got it, you may have gotten up this morning out of bed and felt like the only thing that you were aware of was achy bones and, and creaky joints and, and you didn't feel like anything but warmed over death. But the reality is that our feelings, our physical feelings, even our emotional feelings have nothing to do with the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is granted to us and comes to live within us, the very Spirit of Christ himself, when we become a follower of Jesus. And Paul says because of that, we're not like we used to be, and that we're not weak, not nearly as weak as we think we are, and we're capable if we lean upon and trust in the Holy Spirit's power and presence in us. We're capable of doing marvelous things for God and with God's indwelling presence. It's really Christ who lives in us, who is the hope of glory. And as we trust in him and as we yield to him, his spirit brings uh, great strength to us to withstand and, and to honor God with our life. So living according to the flesh is really making a choice to live by the spirit and to work on the process of letting God produce spiritual fruit in your life. And again, look into Galatians 5 and look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit and ask yourself, uh, is that the way my spirit is working these days or am I focused in on the things that I'm being deprived of? Let's move along. For Paul, this word flesh that he uses so many times here refers not just to our physical appetites. Our tendency is to assume that Basically, what he's thinking of is our baser appetites that too often control our behaviors. That's not really what he's getting at at all. It's not just our physical appetites. It's really referring to the entirety of life in a world that's in rebellion to God. When people ask me, how do you explain repentance? Is it being sorry of your sins or just sorry you got caught sinning? I say to them, the concept of repentance in Scripture is of a person turning around the direction of their life. So you're walking in one direction, and when you repent, you turn around and walk the opposite direction. So picture it this way, that before you came to Christ, you were walking away from God, and you were in a state of rebellion, and God got your attention and awakened you to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. When you turned around and headed back toward God in sorrow for your sin and in commitment to be his follower, you were repenting, you were turning around. And so when he talks about the flesh here, he's talking about that pre-repentant self and really a world that is in rebellion against God, the flesh. And so you have to be very candid and open before God and you have to ask his spirit to let you see into the scriptures the places where uh, the flesh still wants to dominate you because you are no longer 
obligated to that flesh at all. You're no longer obligated to that system. You're free to live differently in Christ. Our obligation is to the Spirit of God within us, not to the old person we used to be. Paul contrasted two different kinds of lifestyles, and he used uh, sentences that we call if-then sentences. Here's one of them. He said, if you, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. And the other one was, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So talking about that first one, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. Paul's got to be talking about spiritual death here, not physical death, because all of us will die. Uh, if Christ does not return in my physical lifetime, I will die a physical death, as all of us will. That is a part of life. Death is a part of life. So he can't be talking about that. He has to be talking about spiritual death. If you live according to the flesh, in other words, if you live in that rebellious state, never repenting of your sin, never coming to Jesus Christ, that leads to death. On the contrary, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Well, in an earlier chapter, Paul talked about the fact that, that in reality, what happened when we came to Christ was is that we died to sin. He literally identified us with Christ at the cross and said our sin that flesh nature was put to death on the cross and that even as Christ was raised from the dead because that old nature is put to death no longer has control over us we have risen to walk in newness of life and that in fact is a kind of a staple statement of anyone who's being baptized buried with Christ and risen to walk in a new life and so this if-then statement, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live, is talking about a reality, not a maybe or a it could be this way. It is saying that if you have come to Christ and thereby put to death the deeds of the flesh, of the body, you will live. That's an assurance. That's a guarantee. And it's a guarantee whose signature is Almighty God himself. The deeds of the body are those acts of the flesh that are done according to the flesh. And again, this, this life he's talking about is not physical, but spiritual in nature. So, this is a beautiful concept. I want to slow down long enough to make sure that you are catching the very significance of this eternal future that we are promised because... The Spirit now lives within us and gives us life and means that we're no longer dominated by the old person we used to be. The second point in the lesson for today is the eternal inheritance that we receive as a result of God's gift. So look at verses 14 and 15 if you have your copy of God's Word there and let me read you what it says. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. Now, girls don't get offended by that. He's just using, <laughs> he's not using masculine terminology here to eliminate half of the gender, but he's trying to say that the people of God, the children of God, are, are people who are led by God's Spirit. We could say it this way, for all those led by God's Spirit are God's children. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, Instead, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, this is a beautiful concept of being adopted into the family of God. If you live by the Spirit, that is, if you're a person who has put to death the old man by trusting in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is alive in you, Paul says we are God's child. And then he begins to talk about what does that mean? There's more to this than just these first two verses. We'll get to that in a minute. But he begins introducing the concept of what it means to be an adopted child of God. 
And he says, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, it's a reality that in the households of Paul's day, whether it was a Roman household or whether it's a Jewish household, uh, the, the children of slaves and the children of the father of the house were treated with respect and pretty much equally, except there was a difference. They were always the children of the slaves versus the children of the father who were heirs to the father's fortune. Paul says that a child of a slave would always be included in the household there as playmates of the children of the master, but yet they are born into a spirit of fear because the slave lives in fear of disappointing his master every day and must figure out how to measure up in order to gain the pleasure and favor of the master. And Paul says, but but you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Now, let it be assured that before we came to Christ, we had plenty to fear. We were in rebellion against the creator of the universe. And it was simply a matter of time until everything that we had become in our uh, rebellious state was going to have to give an account to God and we would suffer the punishment the bill would come due and we would be evicted from this world and the presence of God through eternity, to use our opening illustration. But what we've been born into, being born again from above, what we've been born into is not that of a slave that lives in fear. Instead, we've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So a child could be adopted into the family of the Jewish home, for example. And if they were, if they were adopted, then they became heirs with the rest of the children of the family. And so they no longer lived in the state of a slave, the child of a slave, but now they lived as a child of the master of the home. That's a powerful, powerful concept. Abba, Father. I've read so many different expositors through the years who try to explain the meaning of this concept of, of Abba, Father. And it is, um, it is a beautiful concept. The best way I can explain it to you is to say that he uses this picture to try to draw a picture of a, an intimate relationship with the Father. I picture a child coming in from the play from playing outside and seeing his dad or his mother for the first time since breakfast time and running to their arms with excitement to tell them about the latest thing that he saw, did, experienced. And they take that child in their arms and they hold them and they cuddle them and they love them. And the tenderness and the intimacy of that relationship is what's caught up in that Abba Father. I've heard people talk about that it's equivalent to our term daddy, but yeah, I, I think we've misused the term daddy in so many different ways that it doesn't quite catch what's really here. It is that, that glorious image of a father who loves his children and is ever present and ever ready to receive them into his arms and to show his love for them. And Paul says that's what we've been adopted into. Beautiful picture. But look at verses 16 and 17 in this same chapter. He says, the Spirit himself, and here he's talking about the Spirit who lives within us as God's children. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if you ever had a question about your relationship with God, and you're really struggling with that in your heart, in your spirit, you were struggling with whether you belong to God or not. If you came to this passage in the writings of the Apostle Paul, what he would want you to understand is that the Holy Spirit is there in your life, ready to give testimony both to the Father that you belong to Jesus, but also to you that you belong to Jesus. 
God does not want us to question whether we belong to him or not. His spirit comes to live within us to give us evidence from time to time of his uh, work through us. And so when you find yourself uh, questioning your relationship with the Father, I ask him to help you to see through your spirit's inner promptings, help you to see the likeness of Christ in your life and the fruit of the spirit that are being born out of your life because you follow Jesus. And the spirit will testify in your spirit to whose you are, that you belong to the Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And then he goes on and he says, that's not all. He said, and if we're children, and the if is a statement of fact, since we're children would probably be a better way of translating that to get at the, what Paul is trying to say. So let's say, and since we're children, also we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. My father really does own the cattle on a thousand hill. We really are the children of the God, the creator of the universe, who has all of the resources we need to do whatever, whatever it is that he set before us to do. So we of all people during this time of the pandemic should be more at ease, more at peace, more confident of our future than the world that does not know Jesus because our father is going to take care of his children. We're his heirs. We're joint heirs with Christ. Does that mean that we might not, that there's that a promise that we won't be deprived in some way? No, 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 nothing of, of the sort. In fact, the rest of this passage, he goes into much detail that all of us need to embrace. Listen to it. If children also heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And finally in verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So part of this is the Apostle Paul writing into a time when persecution was not only present, was but was about to be intensified uh, with the people of God. Uh, the Romans uh, were prone to all sorts of multiple gods that they worshipped, but the most heinous and most difficult of the gods that they worshipped became the worship of Caesar himself. Gee, I wonder who came up with that idea. And Caesar worship was beginning and was intensifying at the time that the book of Romans was written, and it got worse after the book of written, Romans was written and would intensify even more as the decades unfolded between the writing of Romans and the writing of the book of Revelation. And so the church of Jesus Christ was suffering at the hands first of Jews who felt like that it was a, it was a heresy of some kind, and then later by Romans who felt like it was a, an offshoot religion that had uh, flown the coop of Judaism and now was out of control and a religion that refused to testify that Caesar is Lord. They keep saying that uh, Jesus is Lord and not Caesar. And so Christianity became a, a focus of persecution, religious persecution. And in this generation, it likely for many Christians meant their death, not just their embarrassment or humiliation, it meant their death uh, from a variety of different means. So when Paul then talks about being joint heirs of Christ, he says the real glory for being an heir of Christ is not only the cat, not only the cattle on a thousand hill. He said the real glory in being joint heirs with Christ is the opportunity to share in his suffering. You know, to embrace suffering is uh, considered a mental illness today. <laughs> and yet Paul is very quick to say what Jesus said long ago. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for my sake. For so persecuted they the prophets before you. 
in reality that there, there is no greater glory that can come to any of us than when, with the Holy Spirit's help, we stand firm in the face of persecution and do not let our Savior down. And Paul knew that. He had fought so many battles already. His life was uh, on the line so many different times before he wrote the book of Romans. And then after he wrote the book of Romans, it got even worse. He suffered even more at the hands of the Jews and later at the Romans. Great deprivation and great persecution. And he believed in all of his heart, and I do too, that we never glory more than whenever we stand faithful to our Savior in the midst of persecution and suffering. But can I give you just a little bit of counsel from a guy who's been around now several generations of the church's history? Uh, I say several generations, several decades of the church's history. I've been in ministry over 50 years, and I've, I've just... Uh, the further I go, the more the truth of what I'm going to share, how big it has become. Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. Now stay with me. During the coronavirus, as a pastor, I haven't been able to be with people who are hurting except by this media or the telephone or text or sending a card or something of that nature. In other words, I can't go and I can't sit with them. I can't hold their hand and I can't pray with them in person. I can't be there. And unfortunately, I've seen during this time several families lose loved ones. And you know what happened to them? They couldn't be with their loved ones. They couldn't go to the nursing home or they couldn't go to the hospital. Uh, they couldn't hold their hand. They couldn't be there when the last breaths were breathed. If that isn't a struggle enough, they couldn't have a funeral. Rare that they could even have a meaningful graveside service. It's been some tough things to live through through the coronavirus. There's be no question about that at all. Now also, there have been a lot of suffering physically. Uh, people who have not been able to get the medical care that they need because the hospitals are not doing any surgeries unless they're emergency surgeries, no elective surgeries. And so people are suffering with pain and difficulties that otherwise they might have been able to relieve. And in the midst of all of this, worldwide, the persecution against the church in third world countries and places where the gospel is not accepted has intensified and uh, mass killings of Christian people in different lands uh, where our enemies are strong. These are hard times and it is real suffering. But if if the worst suffering you've done in the last four weeks is not being able to go to the grocery store without a little bit of discomfort or not being able to go out and walk in the mall or not being able to get up and go wherever you want to go when you want to go, if the worst suffering you've had has been the inconveniences that have come with this stay-at-home policy, Paul would want you to hear his words today. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. There's great glory in standing faithful for Jesus during times of persecution, but there is also great glory beyond this world. Those people who died in the last four weeks that I've known about were Christian people they were in agony physically. And then suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, they experienced glory such as they had never imagined. So this temporary suffering of this world, from Paul's perspective, is a minor thing compared with the eternity of glory we will experience when we leave here. 
when I was talking to, to my Sunday school class about this concept this morning, I said to them, if you had, if, if there was such a thing of a, a graph of your life that showed from your beginning into eternity future, the portion that is lived here on earth in this physical space suit we call our body, that portion would be a tiny, 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 minuscule portion of that graph. So small as, as to almost be lost in perspective when you see the full sweep of eternity that is facing us. What Paul is trying to do for the Roman readers and for us today is to give us perspective. Suffering lasts for a little while. The glory of God's presence lasts for an eternity. So chill out, lean into the Holy Spirit, trust God for the stuff you cannot do, and watch God then bring himself glory through your life day by day. Well, when we think about this, uh, there's a tendency for us to think, well, God doesn't know how I feel. He doesn't know the difficulty, the struggle of my, uh, my, even the fights I have with myself over trying to behave myself as a child of God. Uh, God doesn't understand that. But the writer of the book of Hebrews would quickly disagree with us. He said that Christ understood all of that. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, the writer of Hebrews said, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I don't know whether Paul wrote the book of Hebrews or who did, but they, if there are two writers involved there, they both had exactly the same heart about this issue. That being a child of God, God understands. Our intercessor Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, making intercession for us, has been where we are, has walked our steps, has already been there and done that. And he knows. He never loses touch with you and me and our problems and our struggles. He's aware of what we're going through. Well, the next part of this lesson is an interesting little twist and one I hope that you catch with me. It's about creation being restored. And this begins in verses 19 of chapter 8 of Romans. We know, of course, that uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 31, and chapter 3, verse 17, we see that one part of the collateral damage of the sin of Adam and Eve was its impact on creation itself. We know, for example, that the, the ground was not going to cooperate with Adam anymore in his gardening pursuits. And as a kid who grew up on a farm helping my mom in the garden, I sure know about that. Weeds seem to love to grow within the rows of every vegetable you plant. But also he said to Eve, childbearing is not going to be easy anymore. You're going to labor with childbearing, a terribly intense experience, and much changed. And immediately these little symbolic things are mentioned in Scripture of the immediate impact of sin, not just on Adam and Eve, but upon the environment in which they lived. So when Paul gets into this section of Romans 8, he begins to look at the reality that redemption is going to be about more than just you and me. He said in uh, verses 19 through 21, the creation, the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. 
and this is an interesting thing for me, there's a parenthetical expression in the middle of that verse that makes it a little hard to follow. So I'm going to read it without the parenthetical expression so you can get the gist of what Paul was trying to say. He said, For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. If you caught that, you saw that Paul just personified creation. He made creation a person that has feelings and that has what we call anticipatory hope. Creation is hoping for something better. And it has tied its hopes and dreams to the redemption of you and me, to the final finish of God's work with us, the redemption of humanity from sin. Uh, so it's not just humanity that is suffering the consequences of sin in this world. Uh, you can see the signs of decay all around you. I picture one day, or I've tried to picture in my mind what the Garden of Eden was like, uh, absence of anything unwanted, uh, the color green, it's greenest ever in history. No more brown spots in, in the Florida grass where the water sprinklers aren't hitting the right spot. Everything perfect, all the flowers in full bloom, all the fragrances as filled with, with the beauty and creative energy of God. And creation wants to get back to that. And I want to get forward to that. I want to see that and experience that once again. And the Apostle Paul wants us to understand that this creative process that God is involved in, this recreation that comes with our redemption, is going to include creation itself. Now picture in my mind Jesus talking to his disciples on the night of his betrayal, saying to them, hey, don't be troubled about this. Let not your heart be troubled. You, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I'm going to prepare one for you so that you can come and be with me. The hope and dreams of those apostles at that time was for the restoration of the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus' Jesus' vision was not just earthly. Jesus' vision was of recreating, going back to the beginning, and completely changing everything. And so he is working on the rebuilding project of eternity, preparing a place for us that will absolutely boggle our imagination whenever we see the first glimpses of what God has in store for us. So Paul takes the time to picture all of creation waiting with eager anticipation for restoration. Uh, it is a powerful picture a powerful picture. I don't want to go into too much detail about it. But he goes here on verse 32 that we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. The whole creation. Now what that phrase, the whole creation, means is, it's, that's a good question. It most likely means both the human element and the non-human element of God's creation, that he's thinking of all of God's creation, the plants, the trees, the animals, the human beings. And he says that whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Uh, I've never given birth to a baby, but I've stood beside the uh, delivery room bed with my wife doing that watched her agony. And I know that it is uh, the, one of the biggest miracles I, I know of in the whole childbearing process is how that an added, the woman's attitude during labor is totally different than the woman's attitude immediately after labor is over. Uh, in the midst of the pain and the struggle, there's the feeling that there's no hope. This is more than I can bear. This agony is, is literally killing me. And then when 
the labor is complete, the gift of the new child laid in the arms of the mother changes the attitude and the perspective altogether. And so that which was horrible suffering and labor for so long, immediately there is the reward of this child. That happens to be the concept that Paul is using to talk about the issue of hope. The whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Well, there will be a relief from this labor someday. It's just not yet. And the struggle goes on day by day. I don't know about you, but I look at the brokenness of humanity. I look at my own brokenness and the brokenness of the world around me. And I ask myself, how long can God let this go on? How long will it be before Jesus returns? We've made a mess of his world. We are in labor, intense labor right now. And never in in uh, 52 years of ministry, gospel ministry, have I felt more strongly that the promises in the gospels about the things that will happen in the final chapter of humanity's history, those things appear to me to be fulfilled. I don't know what's keeping Jesus from returning. I really don't accept the long suffering of the Father. Not willing that any should perish, he gives us a little bit more time. But the labor continues and the pains are agony for anyone who has an honest heart who looks at the world the way it is. But then finally this passage talks about humanity being restored Verse 23 and following, look at this. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Paul says it's, it's not just creation that is in labor. It is we who know Jesus, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, in our lives, we also groan, eagerly waiting for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. I've alluded to that in several comments I've already made that, you know, if you're tired, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, broken by sin, your body decaying, uh, tired of seeing wickedness set free on every corner of America, you're groaning and waiting for your redemption. Creation joins you in that labor pain. Even with the Holy Spirit, we feel a sense of groaning and pain within us, eagerly waiting for our adoption and the redemption or the setting free of our bodies from this, this place that, that has become so broken by sin. Verses 24 and 25, he says, Now, in this hope we were saved. In this hope we were saved. In the hope of our redemption, our adoption, uh, our deliverance from this brokenness of sin. Now, in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Isn't that true? I mean, we hope for the things we cannot see. Otherwise, we would not think of it as hope. Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Now, I know many of us think, I, I want patience. I want more patience, and I want it right now. Please don't pray that to God unless you're ready to deal with that. If you start telling God, you know, I just don't have enough patience to put up with this, then God is likely, likely to give you more hard stuff to deal with because the way you develop patience is surviving hard stuff. And so unless you're wanting to subject yourself to even more hardship and difficulty, don't ask for patience. Use the patience God has already given you. And he says, we eager, eagerly wait for our hope to be realized, but we wait with patience. How do you, how do you ex 
how do you identify or how do you express that patience? Well, you have to get the perspective that God is in a position to be able to see what is best for us at any point in time. That he has the perspective of eternity, eternity past, eternity future, that helps to put our present into perspective. He can see where we're going. He, he can see and knows what his plan is for us. And so if you understand that the creator of everything that is has a plan and a purpose for us, and that the, the big deal is not this present existence here on planet Earth. The big deal is our eternal existence with him and his heaven. When you put that in perspective, then it helps you to sort of set low in the boat and to ride out whatever storms you find yourself in in life. Have patience, he said. Uh, Paul returned to a concept here he'd introduced over in verse 20, the concept of hope. And he identifies that by its nature, hope is not something you've received. It's, it's not what you can see. It's something you're looking for. Uh, we've been saved and given the Spirit as our first fruits and adopted into God's family, and yet we still live in this fallen world, still waiting for the full completion of our salvation when we receive our glorified bodies and dwell with the Lord forever. And that, I think, is the unseen thing we hope for our glorified bodies and our dwelling place in heaven with the Lord forever. I think that's what we wait for and what we hope for. Uh, patience, the word there describes the capacity to bear up under difficult circumstances. It's easy to be a Christian when everything's going your way. The challenge becomes when circumstances become difficult and we have to reach inside us and find the strength of the Holy Spirit to remain sweet, to remain kind, to remain patient, to remain faithful to God. When we come to the end of this particular study, what should be our conclusion? What should be our, um, our outcome? Well, spiritually, it would seem to me that we would want to Pray to commit to live our lives according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. And to live our lives according to the Spirit until the time we die or until Jesus returns, whichever may come first. To commit that we will be like a child of God by choosing to obey the Holy Spirit, not the whims and desires of who we were before we came to Jesus. So this week, I hope as you face whatever the coronavirus may throw in your direction, whether it may be uh, another inconvenience that you have to deal with, or uh, God forbid that you personally contract the virus or someone you love does, of whatever circumstances you find yourself in, you will not feel overwhelmed by the circumstances, but will remember that the Holy Spirit who lives within you is the Spirit of God who is capable of helping you through whatever you may face. Turn to Him and depend upon Him and convince yourself that the one who is able to is the one who lives within you, the same one who died for you, and the same one who is coming for you in the future. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will take this time of Bible study and you will bring encouragement and hope and challenge to anyone who happens to take the moment to listen to it. And I pray that your Holy Spirit can overcome my shortcomings and make this a, a media that actually speaks truth into the hearts of your people. And we pray, Father, and commit ourselves to live in the Holy Spirit, 
to depend upon him and to ask him to help us to give fruit that will bring, bring great glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we pray this together in his name. Amen. So thank you for tuning in to this and taking the time to listen to me. And, you know, if you've got this link from whatever means and you want to pass it on to someone else to listen to this, uh, you have my permission to do that. God bless you.